My name is Charlene Margo, co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture, and we are delighted to have with us tonight Greg Baer and Ryan Rizeski. Please take it away, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Ryan. Let's hit the show. Thank you. Yeah, Charlene, I really appreciate it. Bev, I did not know you were also a Chatham graduate. We will catch up afterward. All right. So thank you everyone so much for being here. We're so grateful. It is just a little after 8 p.m. here in Mr. Rogers' real life neighborhood of Pittsburgh, where we're both calling from. Um, so let's start with an easy one. How many of you, well, I can't see you, if you grew up watching with Mr. Rogers, I want you to think of one word or one phrase that comes to mind when you think about what that experience was like. You can just go ahead and type them in the chat. When you see an image of this guy, what's the first feeling that comes to mind? I see joy, gentle, trustworthy. I love that one. Safe, kind. kindness, welcoming, friendly, peace. These are all fantastic words. So many of you remember Mr. Rogers and you connect with him emotionally. And you almost certainly remember the way that he made us all feel accepted, special, and safe. You might also remember his favorite number, which was 143. It was his code for I love you. There's one letter in I, four letters in love, and three letters in you. It was Fred and his television program who helped all of us and millions of others feel loved. And right now, in me and Ryan, and in this slide, you're looking at two of them. I'm Greg Bear. I'm the executive director of the Grable Foundation and co-chair for a learning ecosystem we call Remake Learning. And my name is Ryan Radzeski. I am a science and education writer and also a dad of a very young child and a former teacher. I taught fourth and fifth grade in Louisiana. But all you really need to know about Greg and me, at least for right now, is that we are children of Western Pennsylvania, right here in Pittsburgh. So like Mr. Rogers himself, we were born here, we moved to different parts of the country for a while, and eventually we found our respective ways home. So we grew up with this deep emotional connection to Fred because here in Pittsburgh, here in Western Pennsylvania, he really was our neighbor. And so we grew up with this connection to him that we know lots of you probably share too. Now, in a couple of years ago, we published this book which is our book about Fred's enduring lessons and why they still matter today. And along the way, we learned a few things about Fred that we wanna share with you tonight. And we think after spending some time with us in the neighborhood again, you'll see why Fred can be as helpful to us as parents, neighbors, and human beings as he ever has been in our lives. So lesson number one, Fred Rogers was not a saint. Now, the first thing that people always ask me and Greg when we talk about this book is, was Fred really like that? And the answer, amazingly, was yes. The Fred you saw on the street was the same as the Fred you saw on television. But that's different from saying he was perfect because he wasn't. Fred, like everybody else, especially all of us parents, sometimes he got angry. Sometimes he made mistakes. Fred Rogers didn't always get it right. But we didn't need Fred to be perfect, right? Because none of us are perfect. What's more useful and what we got in Mr. Rogers was just a regular guy, someone who, despite all the flaws that come with being a human, all the flaws that come with being a parent, committed himself to being the person children needed him to be every day of his life. Um, in the foreword to our book, Fred's now late wife, Joanne, wrote, no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers himself. So who was Fred and who was he working so hard to become? Well, he was way more than a nice guy in a cardigan. Fred was born in 1928 in a town called Latrobe, Pennsylvania, just to the east of Pittsburgh. Now, we're not going to go too deeply into Fred's background tonight. Some of you have probably read a bi biography about Fred. Maybe you've seen Morgan Neville's amazing documentary. I dare you not to cry during the last 10 minutes of that documentary. Maybe you saw the biopic starring Tom Hanks. There's so much that has brought Fred back to our cultural fore. That said, there's some things that we all need to know and understand about the neighborhood if we want to understand Fred's work. And the first thing is this. Fred actually hated television when he first encountered it. Can you imagine this? The first thing he ever saw was this, people throwing pies in each other's faces. And he hated seeing the technology being used in this way to demean other human beings. But at the same time, he saw the technology's potential. 
And he decided as he enrolled at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary that he wanted to use this newfangled technology of television to minister to children, as he said. And fortunately, his teachers there said, well, Fred, if you're gonna do that, you better learn something about child development theory and practice. And that's how he ended up at a place called Arsenal Children's Center in Pittsburgh. Now, this is where the story gets incredibly interesting because it was at Arsenal that there happened to be some of the world's foremost and most brilliant psychologists, pediatricians, and psychiatrists all working together at the same exact period of time. So there are folks like Benjamin Spock, the doctor whose book Baby and Child Care remains one of the best-selling books in American publishing history. You probably have this book in your house or your aunt or uncle has it in the attic. You can still find it in Barnes and Nobles. It's a significant book in child development theory and practice. Now there was also Eric Erickson, the world-renowned psychologist. And most importantly for us in this story tonight, there was Margaret McFarland, who's a psychiatry professor at the University of Pittsburgh who came, Fred, became Fred Rogers' lifelong mentor and his dear friend. So you see studying at this place called Arsenal, put Fred at the cutting edge of child development, science and practice. And he took what he learned from the people there and that place and he had blended it with original songs and stories, puppetry, building what became known as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. You see every aspect of this program, from Fred's words to the wardrobe to this physical set itself at which we're looking, was grounded in science. And this is an incredibly overlooked part of Fred Rogers' legacy, but he was more than a nice guy in a sweater. He's what today we call learning scientist. And in so many ways, he was a learning scientist who was decades ahead of his time. So today we know more than we ever have about how children learn. As a field, what's become known as the science of learning now includes everything from behavioral science to neuroscience, uh, artificial intelligence. Some of you have probably tried this new tool called ChatGPT. It is absolutely amazing how technology is going to impact learning. And what's really fascinating about the field of the learning sciences to us is the degree to which today's scientists are validating the degree to which today's scientists are even mirroring what Fred Rogers was doing 50 years ago right here in Pittsburgh. So I'll give you a concrete example of this. Take the title of our book, When You Wonder, You're Learning. That comes from a song of Fred's called Did You Know? Some of you might remember it. I'll let Fred take one quick verse here. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know when you wonder? You're learning. Did you know when you marvel, you're learning about all kinds of wonderful, all kinds of marvelous, marvelously wonderful things? So you can hear it's a song about curiosity, right? It's a song about the value of curiosity as it relates to getting smarter. Now, compare these lyrics on the left to this quote from a research paper on the right. It says curiosity may put the brain in a state that allows it to learn and return any kind of information, like a vortex that sucks in what you're motivated to learn and also everything around it. In other words, when you're curious, your brain starts to take in information. Mr. Rogers was right. When you wonder, you are learning. And this paper, by the way, came out in 2014. Fred wrote, did you know, in 1979. We could spend all night talking about the ways in which learning science is just now catching up to Fred. But the bottom line is this, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, if we want it to be, can be more than a pleasant memory in the minds of us adults. It is also a resource. It is a blueprint. It's something that if we study can help us become better parents, better educators, better neighborhoods, better human beings. It can help us raise creative, curious, caring kids. And, you know, when we talk about where Fred's tools are helpful, when we talk about how Fred can help children learn, we're not just talking about classrooms. We're also talking about living rooms and libraries and museums and beyond, because as Greg will tell you. Fred appreciated and knew that learning happens everywhere. So, so many of you are familiar with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Think back to all of the places where we got to learn. Where did we learn? Of course, it was in that kitchen and in the land of make-believe, but it was also crayon factories and community gardens at the music shop, in all sorts of places. The list goes on. The point being that Mr. Rogers built Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Now he understood and appreciated the key role of schools, 
but he also knew that schools and early learning centers are only part of the learning landscape, a learning landscape that includes our living rooms and our science centers and our parks and children's museums and all of the places where we are fortunate to go and where young people are learning alongside caring adults in their lives. And part of the reason that Ryan and I wrote this book is that because for the last 15 years, in this corner of the world, we've been building a landscape like this in Fred's own backyard. We call it Remake Learning. It's a network of educators in and out of school, early childhood through higher education. Thousands of individuals representing more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, after school programs, creative industries, campuses of higher education, all of whom are advancing, as we like to say, relevant, engaging, and equitable learning for young people whom we know are navigating these times of rapid technological and social change. And because Remake Learning is situated right here in Western Pennsylvania, we often say that the educators involved in Remake Learning use the FRED method, referring of course to Mr. Rogers. And when we say the FRED method, we mean that they're going about their work as FRED did. They're connecting whole child theory and practice and frameworks with what we're learning about learning itself. Think about it like a simple equation, whole child, plus the learning sciences equals the Fred method. In so many ways, our book springs forth from this incredible learning landscape that we call Remake Learning. And it takes this whole landscape to nurture what Fred called his tools for learning. So if you remember the neighborhood, you remember it was an educational television program, but Fred never focused on things like fractions or spelling words. Instead, he focused on a different aspect of learning. And I'm gonna play you just a quick clip that I think explains what that aspect of learning was. Neighbor, welcome again to this neighborhood. I'd like to show you something. You know what this is? Maybe if I press this button. This is a cassette player with a little cassette in here, and there's nothing written on it, so we'll just have to play it to see what it is. Do you ever imagine things? Are they scary things? Are they scary? Do you ever imagine things? Are the things you'd like to do? Did you ever see a cat's eyes in the dark? I wonder what they were. Did you ever pretend to buy things like that? Did you ever pretend to buy things? Okay, so I think we're having some technical difficulties with the video there, but Fred focused on curiosity. And Ryan, Ryan, we should say you can find this great video at <laughs> the PBS Digital Studios website, uh, Garden in the Mind. It's a great video to watch. So yeah, Fred focused on things that uh, if you were able to hear this video, he says grew the garden of the mind. These were things like curiosity, things like creativity and communication. These were Fred's tools for learning. He said, I would rather give children the tools for learning. If we give them the tools, then they'll want to learn the facts. And more importantly, they'll use the facts to build and not destroy. So Fred knew that academic learning has to be paired with a nurturing of what's best in us. He knew that one without the other is insufficient. You need both in order to raise complete human beings. And here again, learning science is proving Fred right. That's right. Not only do Fred's tools for learning still matter today, they might be more important now than they were decades ago. And scientists, parents, employers, just about everyone now says that Fred's tools are essential to children's success. Now, one of the most amazing examples of this comes from a company called Google, not so far down the road for, from where some of you are situated. And you may know that a few years back, the company tried to figure out what makes for a great boss at this company called Google. And for a long time, they assumed you know, the best programmers must automatically make for the best managers. Now, fortunately, they decided to test this assumption with something internal to the company that they called Project Oxygen. And through Project Oxygen, they analyzed tens of thousands of data points, things like performance reviews, employee surveys, exit interviews, and they found that while technical expertise, of course, still mattered, it was still important. It ranked nearly last, ranked nearly last among the things that mattered most. You see, the other more important things were things like communication, about things like caring about employees. They wanted all the qualities that Fred taught so well, the very human qualities that no machine can replace. Now, these qualities are up to 10 times, 10 times more predictive of long-term success than our test scores. 
And you know this, they cost almost nothing to develop and they hinge on the very things that make our lives worth living. Self-acceptance, close loving relationships, and a deep regard for our neighbors. So let's dig into some of them right now. So the first one we talk about in our book is curiosity. And I'll tell you a very quick, interesting study about curiosity. So in 2007, a psychologist named Michelle Chenard published a really interesting experiment. Chenard and her colleagues recorded four children from the time they were 14 months old until they were just older than five. They were trying to figure out what is it the kids do? What do they talk about when left alone, when left to their own devices? And so they collected 230 hours of recorded conversation among these four kids. And what they found, even though their sample size was small, was pretty revealing because these four kids, when left to their own devices, tended to do one particular thing. And any of you who've ever spent time with small children can probably guess what that one thing was. They asked questions. They asked a ton of questions. In fact, these four kids asked on average more than a hundred questions an hour. You know, so suffice it to say that kids are curious. Kids are inherently curious. The world is a big, beautiful, messy, dirty, dangerous place, and they want to know how it all works. And we know from modern learning science that the more curious kids are, the more their learning sticks. Susan Engel is one of the world's leading experts on children's curiosity, and she says the best way to ensure that they'll absorb and retain information is to incite that curiosity. And so you'd think that as adults, you know, as parents, as teachers, as anyone who works with kids, you would think that our top priority then would be inciting that curiosity. But as you probably remember from your own time as a student, as you probably remember from your own time as a kid, it's not always the case. In fact, when Engel herself went out into schools to study this, this is what she found. In kindergarten, in any given two hour stretch, they saw anywhere from two to five questions. In fifth grade classrooms, a typical two hour stretch of time often didn't yield one student question. So that's two hours in a classroom when we know that some kids, again, at least under the right conditions, would ask upwards of 100 questions an hour. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we tap and nurture the natural curiosity that children bring to us? Now, fortunately, Fred Rogers left us some answers. One of the most important things he learned from his mentor, Margaret McFarland, who you heard Greg introduce earlier, was the Quaker philosophy that attitudes are caught, not taught. Fred knew how important it was to show viewers that he's a learner too. And so if you watch any episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you find Fred talking about how many questions he has. You find him telling viewers how much he wants to know about the world. You'll find him singing songs like, did you know? Did you know when you wonder you're learning? Fred knew how important it was to show viewers that he's a learner too. And this is why. It's what you bring to the children every day, he said, that encourages and inspires, children's to ask, inspires children to ask questions and to be imaginative. By responding thoughtfully to children's questions, you're encouraging their curiosity. Even when you don't know the answer, you're letting them know that it's good to wonder and ask. Now, one of the people we spoke to while researching our book was Hedda Sheripan. Hedda was a producer in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood who worked with Fred all the way back from the very first day of production back in the late 1960s. She's also an incredible educator in her own right. And Hedda shared with us a really fun real world example of how we can do this for kids. And I'm gonna let Greg take it because it's one of his favorites. I love this because it's so <laughs> simple, so practical, and you're gonna be able to see how you could do this right in your own kitchen. So Hedda shared with us this example of walking into a classroom and seeing in the front of the classroom a very large empty wicker basket, thinking, well, that's curious. Why is this basket here taking up space? Hedda steps to the back of the classroom because she wants to watch the lesson unfold in, in this space. And she notices that the kids in this classroom are asking all sorts of questions, right? That there's that atmosphere of learning that's allowing for them to ask all of those questions. Now, some of the questions are right on point, and the teacher is taking the moment in the pedagogically right way to, to answer in that moment. But more often than not, those questions are coming from right out over the left field wall, like, boy, that's a bazonkers question. The wonderful thing is that the teacher does is she notices the question, she doesn't comment about it, acknowledges it, takes a moment to write it down on a piece of paper, 
puts it in the large wicker basket and says, together later, we're gonna wonder about the answers to your question. Now, the wonderful thing that happens there is that kids know that their big questions matter. No matter what their questions are, they feel respected, they feel safe, they feel like they belong, and they feel like they're in a space where amongst peers and caring adults, all of their big feelings and all of their big questions matter, and they have a chance to ask them. It's a wonderfully beautiful thing that you and I can do in our own kitchen, rather than saying, hey, Alexa, right? Think of all the questions that your own kids or your grandkids or the neighborhood kids are asking. It's about creating that atmosphere for learning. Here's a, a modern day example of this, because this is an early learning classroom whose teachers worked with a computer robotics laboratory, Carnegie Mellon University, to use digital cameras to, take, to allow the kids to take pictures that were then attached to audio files and sent by SMS tech, uh, texting technology, such that in the middle of the day, you might get a text to say, hey, Greg was looking at the blue fish in the aquarium today, right? And, and you hear your own child talking about it, such that at the end of the day, when I, go up to, when I go to pick up my child, the question isn't like, oh, what did you do today? Or do you have a good day? Or do you have a good lunch? It's, I noticed that you saw the blue fish. Tell me about the blue fish. Imagine how that inspires conversation and curiosity in the most beautiful of ways. I mean, kids have to know that it's okay to wonder. That's what both of these examples are about. The Ask It Basket and Message From Me, this classroom app. Kids also have to know what's out there to wonder about. Fred knew that it's hard for young children, really that it's hard for adults too, to be curious about something that's entirely unfamiliar to them. So we want to do a quick experiment. I think we have time for this. I'm going to give you all a name and I want you to type in the chat how much curiosity that name stokes for you. Okay. You can type a one if you know you hear this name and you think, Ryan, thank you for coming, but uh, it's getting late on the West Coast. I got to get dinner ready. My kids are home from school. Let's move this along. And I won't take any offense to that. I want you to type a three, if you think, all right, that's kind of interesting. Tell me a little bit more. And I want you to type five if you are so enthralled by this name that you just can't wait to hear what's next, okay? The name is Angus the monkey. Go ahead and rate curiosity. I see a five already. That's some, all right, some threes. People are curious. All right. So this is a curious group, right? I'm impressed with the fives. There's a one. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Bishop. I appreciate your honesty. All right. I'm going to give you all a little bit more information, okay? Angus the monkey was a soccer mascot. And in 2002, Angus the monkey was elected mayor of a small town in England. Go ahead and type a Y if you're a little bit more curious now in the chat. Type an N if you're still not convinced. Okay, we got some more. Why? We got some more. Why, Why Ryan? <laughs> Why? I see an N. Okay, we have a couple holdouts. I'm going to give you a little bit more information. So, not only did Angus the monkey serve the term as mayor, Angus the monkey was re-elected two more times. Type an exclamation point in the chat if you want to learn more about Angus the monkey at this point. Oh, uh, they're pouring in. Excellent. So, if I were, <laughs> exactly. oh, I see what? three exclamation points. <laughs> If I were your parent, right, or if I were your teacher, or if I were the librarian sitting with you in a reading circle, I could use that wonder, I could use that curiosity to open up a discussion about elections or voting rights, really anything that I want. And that's why Fred, whenever he introduced us to something new, he always started with something that was familiar, right? He started with his fish tank, or he started with his sandbox, or often he started with something as simple as a box of crayons. Fred knew that curiosity doesn't spring from nowhere, right? It doesn't come from a void. It comes from something that kids already know about and something they want to learn more about. And that actually takes us to our next tool for learning. And as, as we turn to this next tool, Ryan, I think of those crayons, right? Because I think about that, that crayon factory. So many of us love that episode and remember it because it's distinctive, right? But Fred didn't start with the factory or like how they're made. He started with that crayon that we were familiar with. And Fred did more. He protected our creativity. Back in 1968, George Land 
tested the creativity of 1,000 five-year-olds using a test that he developed for NASA, our space agency. And he, he found out that so many of those kids scored so highly, it was 98% scored so highly that they qualified as creative geniuses. As with curiosity, kids are naturally creative. They make up stories and songs, they draw pictures, and you know, they develop sometimes unusual ingenious solutions to the problems in their life. Now, George Land also discovered something else because he tested the same group of five-year-olds every few years. And at 10 years old, the share of creative geniuses fell from 98% to 30%. By 15 years old, the share fell to 12%. By adulthood, it fell to 2%, from 98% to 2%. Now, what Land and his team concluded was not that creativity naturally fades with age, but that we all learn non-creative behaviors. You see, as we get older and more self-conscious, and we spend more time learning environments that aren't equipped to nurture our natural drive to create, we learn to be less open and less innovative. And Fred himself talked about this. He said this, what happens if children hear that their mud pies are no good and their block buildings have no importance? All right. So how is it that we protect and nurture the creativity that kids are born with? How are we gonna help them counter the non-creative behaviors that they're inevitably gonna learn as they get older? Well, in the neighborhood, it began with you and me. It began with the adults. And you remember every day watching that show, we'd see Fred engage in some creative pursuit that maybe some of us consider childish. You see, he was there at the kitchen table. He was cutting construction paper, gluing felt together, putting popsicle sticks together. Whatever it was that he was doing, he made it clear that it brought him great joy. And it wasn't just Fred. Do you remember the people we got to meet on the show? People like Whitten Marsalis and Julia Child, Yo-Yo Ma. And Fred didn't focus on their accomplishments. He focused on their passions and the joy of what it is that they do. And it wasn't just these celebrities, right? Do you remember Officer Clemens? What was, also, what was Officer Clemens? Anyone remember? He was also the neighborhood opera singer. How about Handyman Negri, also the neighborhood guitarist? You see, all of these guest stars and all of these recurring characters showed us that creativity isn't just for kids and that we don't have to give up our creative pursuits that enrich our lives as we get older. Now on this next screen, you're going to see my Madrid skateboard. And in fact, Ryan, I forgot I have it right here. I and have never seen you pull it out in person. <laughs> this is my, so I bring out my Madrid skateboard because I used to be a skateboarding enthusiast. I loved to skateboard as a kid. And for some reason, during that first week or two of this horrible pandemic, I walked into my garage and I found this skateboard that I just cannot part with. I haven't been on it in 35 years. And for some reason, no helmet, no elbow pads, no shoulder pads, I got on my skateboard. And you have to understand my, my, my driveway is an incline. And then I live on a hill that goes down the hill, ends in a cul-de-sac. And you can imagine, I got on the skateboard and I immediately started to panic, like, oh, good Lord, what have I done, right? And at the same time, the joy of all of those days that I spent skateboarding came rushing back to me. Now, I'm happy to tell you, I got to the bottom of the cul-de-sac. I didn't kill myself. What I hadn't noticed is that my two daughters were running behind me. And it wasn't just my two, my two daughters. It was six of their friends. Because I'm sure all, they're all like, oh, what is Mr. Bear doing? I'm not even sure that any of them had ever seen a skateboard, right? And they're like, why is this crazy guy? Why is their dad on a skateboard? Do you know that today there are eight young women in my neighborhood who are skateboarding enthusiasts? Now, I'm not going to pretend to be a social scientist and say A cause B, but we all know what happened in that moment. And Fred Rogers talked about it. The best teacher in the world is the one who loves what he or she does and loves it right in front of you. Unbeknownst to me, in that moment, I was the best teacher in the world about skateboarding for these kids. <laughs> so before we move on, we just want to take a moment to pause because we're curious about what it is that you love to do, right? What is the thing that you do that makes you feel most alive? I want you to take just a couple of seconds to think about that to yourself because often, you know, in adulthood, we don't get a lot of time to indulge those things. Greg, you hadn't been in a skateboard in how many years? 35. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes we let these things slide. So I just want you to take maybe 15 seconds to think about what's something that you love to do? What gives you that good feeling that Fred Rogers himself such a good used to sing about? Me. 
to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling. You're growing inside. And when you wake up, ready to say, I think I'll let Does anyone want to share? Sure. Oh, they're already coming in. Oh my gosh. Reading children's books, painting, trying something new, like the wind tunnel you made for your students. I'd love to see that. Singing, ukulele, being in the ocean. ocean, acting. That's cool. Being totally present and immersed in a preschooler's world. I bet that is. Um, Snowboarding, ballroom <laughs> dancing. These are great. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the question for us as parents is how do we bring more of these things that we love into our homes, into our lives? What does it really take to light ourselves up in front of kids? And how, you know, what would it take to connect our kids with other adults who have other passions, who have other interests? I'll give you one quick example of a fun way we've seen this happen here in Pittsburgh. A couple of months ago, two teachers just north of the city of Pittsburgh for their, you know, their thing, the thing that lights them up is just reading great books. These are two uh, literacy enthusiasts. And what they did is created an event called Literacy Under the Lights in which they brought folks from the community to read books about what it is that they love to do and to read those books to children. So up here, you see a barber reading a book about why he loves being a barber. At the bottom, we see a music teacher talking about why he loves music and actually letting kids play with some keyboards. Again, loving what we love as adults and loving it in front of kids, whether they're our kids or other kids. And we know the role of adults is so important. In fact, we talk about this in our book. Um, in the 1980s, two psychologists, Dorothy and Jerome Singer, uh, after years of a longitudinal study, discerned four key things that are most important when it comes to raising creative kids. And the number one thing that mattered most was an adult who joins in children's play. One of you put this in the uh, chat, being totally immersed in a preschooler's world is the best way to ensure that those preschoolers grow up to be creative kids. You also need a dedicated sacred space for that play. Now, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. In fact, in our book, we talked to a guy who I think uh, it was Bill Strickland, Greg, his mom gave him the laundry room to turn into a uh, photo developing, uh, basically a dark room. Unstructured free time, you know, we have to let kids just get bored. It's really hard to get bored now, whether you're a kid or an adult, because there's constantly something else to do. There's always another source of stimulation. And lastly, simple objects that enrich the imagination. If you watch episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he's not promoting creativity with fancy gadgets or expensive equipment. Instead, he's playing with spoons or he's playing with crayons or he's cutting construction paper. Again, all these things that we know are so important when it comes to raising creative kids, which takes us to our next lesson. And as we turn to it, what you all don't see is the skateboard is now under my desk and my feet are riding on it. <laughs> Lesson nine, Fred showed us that we're worth being proud of. So back in the 1970s, Hallmark, the greeting card company, invited celebrities to design holiday displays for their flagship Manhattan store. Now, one display was noticeably different from all the others. It was a single pine tree, about the height of a child, encased in clear click, acrylic. It had no lights, no tinsel, no ornaments. It didn't even say who designed it. There was only a simple plaque that read this. I like you just the way you are. Now, of course, we know who the designer was. If there was one message at the core of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it was this, that I like you just the way you are. And though we don't always think about feeling accepted as a basic human need, those feelings matter as much as food and water matter in our lives. Now, there are all sorts of interesting studies about this. And so I'll share just briefly one from the learning sciences from this century. So a group of researchers gave some college-age students a fake personality test. And then, this, uh, then they separated the, the group into three based on their supposed results. Now they told group number one, you're gonna have rich, rewarding relationships throughout your life. It's, your marriage is going to flourish. Your, your friendships are going to be rich. It's gonna be really special. Group number two, it, it's, it's not as rich. Your, your friendships 
you'll have them, but they'll fade. And your marriage, you might struggle in your partnership and, and you might spend some of your life alone. And then they said, okay, group number three, I'm a little worried for you. And we don't know exactly why this is the case, but based on the results of this personality test, you're in for it, right? Like life is gonna be rough. There could be accidents. You're gonna be falling downstairs. We hope you have health insurance, so good luck. Now, based on those results, they then gave all of these students a fake IQ test. Well, actually it was a real IQ test based on the fake personality results. Which group bombed this IQ test? Type into the chat. Was it group number one, group number two, or group number three? I'll take a moment to see where you fall. One, two, or three? None. All right, we got a couple for group number three. Most are in group three. Star Vista Zoom at six, you're at number two. Okay, well here I'm pleased to tell you, oh, Abigail, you and Star Vista are correct. It's actually group number two. See, most of us think, of course it must be group number three. Like they just got horrible bad news. But you see, it wasn't bad news that caused a drop in the IQ test scores but rather it was for group number two, that prospect of social isolation, of being excluded, of being rejected. You see, when, when confronted with this horrible idea of spending their lives with less lit, rich relationships, spending it partly alone, these students lost the ability in that moment to think, to employ their logic, to reason clearly, to do the things that they would normally do. Now, fortunately, the researchers said, okay, everyone, this has been a great big ruse. This is a fake personality test. This is not your destiny. And this study underscores the radical message of Fred's radical message of radical acceptance. That is that we all need the same thing to know that we're worth being proud of, whether we're a preschooler or a retired person. Each of us needs to know that we somehow make a difference in our being alive. We need to know that we're worth being proud of. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Kids and adults have to know that they matter to the people around them, that they're worth being proud of just the way they are. I like you just the way you are. Now showing this doesn't mean that we tell kids that everything that they do or say is perfect or even good or okay, but it does mean this. It means that we refuse to reject their humanity, that we refuse to make them feel less than, that we refuse to make them feel that their joys or their flaws or their full complicated selves make them unworthy of the neighborhood. Fred used to say that love is an active noun like the word struggle, that to love someone is to struggle to accept them exactly as he or she is right now. And that's not always easy, you know that. And as parents, it's the most important gift we can give to our young people which takes us to our next lesson, which is that all of us can do a version of what Fred did. Um, in the foreword to our book, Fred's wife, Joanne, wrote this. The truth of Fred's ministry is that every last one of us can be as caring, kind, and influential in children's lives as he was. Every last one of us can do a version of what Fred did. So what did Fred do? And sometimes it's hard to answer that question. In fact, we like to turn to a famous poem by the writer Raymond Carver that explains what Fred did for all of us. Some of you might know this poem, it's called Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. At the end of the day, what's the one thing that matters more than anything else? To call ourselves beloved, to feel ourselves beloved on the earth. And that's what Fred did for us. And before we move on, curious just one more time, are there people in your life that have made you feel that way, made you feel beloved on the earth? Or are there people you've made feel that way? Maybe they're your children, maybe they're your spouse. How do you make people feel the same way that Fred made you feel? Again, just take about 10, 15 seconds to think about that to yourself. <laughs>
Thank you. I see some really moving answers here in the chat box. Charlene, your mom, your husband, some of you saying you hope you've done that for others. I love these examples, my children, absolutely, absolutely. I love these examples because they take us to our penultimate lesson, right? The greatest thing we can do is let people know that they are loved and capable of loving. And this is a quote of friends. There's really not much that Greg and I can say to add to it, except to try to add a little bit of that love to the world ourselves. And so we're gonna end tonight by doing an exercise that Fred himself used to do when he gave speeches. And we think that this exercise sums up everything Fred did. We think it sums up everything that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was about. And so I'm just gonna read it to you word for word. From the time you were very little, you've had people who have talked you into talking, sung you into singing, smiled you into smiling, loved you into loving. Some of them may be here right now. Some may be far away. Some may even be in heaven. But wherever they are, if they have loved you and encouraged you and wanted what was best in life for you, then they're right inside yourself. And I feel that you deserve some quiet time on this special occasion to devote some thought to them. So let's just take a minute in honor of all those who have cared about us all along the way. One silent minute. Greg and I will watch the time. As you gather your thoughts, we wanna to turn to our last lesson. And that is to add a little bit of love to this world. Around the turn of the millennium, Fred issued us all this challenge. Try your best to make goodness attractive, he said. That's one of the toughest assignments you'll ever be given. And Fred was right, it is tough. It's easier to tear down than it is to build. It's easier to fear than it is to love. But if we want to do more than just prepare future workers, if we want every child to have the freedom to discover her potential, if we want to raise creative, curious, caring kids, if we want to build a stronger, more inclusive community and a more just and loving world, then making goodness attractive is what we have to do. And whomever it was that you were thinking about during your one silent minute, maybe it was a parent, a teacher, a friend, someone else on the Zoom, maybe it was even Fred Rogers himself. He or she is proof that making goodness attractive is possible. How will we do the same for the kids about whom we care? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been such an honor. Thank you so much to the wonderful, nice comments in the chat. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. So. I'm going to open up the Q&A, and if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in there. And Charlene, please take it away. Thank you, Greg and Ryan. It's going to be hard to even talk after that. You know, I'm with Cindy, who said, best episode ever. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This was just incredible. Hmm. I think we all Thank feel you. really inspired, and we really feel that Mr. Rogers was with us tonight. He would be happy. Um, I want to start out by asking a question that you touched on at the beginning, but for those of you who may not have been on in the first few minutes, can you tell us again what brought you to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and what got you together to decide to write this book? Yeah, yeah so I can, we can tell you our exact aha moment. 
Um, so Greg and I, as, as part of our, our day jobs, the work we're privileged to do, we work for the Grable Foundation, which is a family uh, philanthropy based here in Pittsburgh that supports people who are working to improve the lives of, of children and youth. And part of the privilege of doing that work and part of the responsibility of doing that work well is learning as much as we possibly can about what works when it comes to learning, what works when it comes to teaching, what works when it comes to parenting. And so a lot of what we were doing well before we ever thought to write the book was just reading research papers and talking to scientists and going out into the field and talking to some of the best teachers and the best parents and the best librarians we could possibly meet here in Pittsburgh. And what we realized over time was that, you know, every time we read a new study, or went to a new conference or heard a new lecture, learning scientists weren't speaking very scientifically. You know, we expected lots of charts and graphs, but instead they were asking questions. They were asking questions like, how do we make sure kids feel safe? How do we make sure that kids feel cared for? How do we make sure that they belong to a community that cares about them? And so we realized over time, you know, we like to say that these scientists sounded like script writers in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And we realized, well, maybe there's another story to tell about this figure who we all love so much, uh, who really was a learning scientist and who, um, you know, I don't think has gotten his due as somebody who is just as bit as influential in education as someone like John Dewey or uh, Maria Montessori or some of the other giants in the field. And um, Charlie and I think we'll add to, we're lucky to live and, and be raised here in Western Pennsylvania. We still think of ourselves as, as kids of Western Pennsylvania and, and Fred Rogers was from this corner of the earth. And there are two places, the Fred Rogers Institute at St. Vincent College that carries on the work uh, and the legacy and, and, and pushes forward this incredible legacy that Fred left us. And also Fred Rogers Productions which uh, is now once again, the largest producer of children's multimedia for PBS. And it's uh, through Fred Rogers Productions on that website that you can find episodes of, of Mr. Rogers um, television shows, which is a question I know the, the bishops were asking. Yes, can you clarify that last point again quickly, Greg, where those shows can be viewed? Yeah, so Fred Rogers Institute, which is exactly that, type fredrogersinstitute.org. That is the um, institute at, at, at St. Vincent College. And then Fred Rogers Productions, which is at fredrogers.org. <laughs> and you'll find Fred Rogers Productions. All right, thank you for that. Um, we love Fred Rogers, but a lot of adults today and parents think that he was kind of slow and old fashioned and simple. How do you convince people to, and I think you've done it tonight, but I'll ask anyway, how do you convince people to get beyond this view and to see the value in his science of learning as relevant today? Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, Fred would, Fred didn't want us to be more Freds. Fred wanted us to be Charlene and Ryan and our unique, genuine, authentic selves. And so one, I think we need to start with with ourselves and what it is that we can do. And there was there were so many profound things that Fred Rogers said. One time a journalist was asking Fred like, what is it that you're doing with this television program? And his response was, I'm creating an atmosphere. Yeah. Well, that's something that you and I can do whether we have fond feelings for Mr. Rogers or not, because Fred Rogers took the learning sciences of his day. Think of all the child development theory and practice, the parenting resources that we have available to us today. We know more than we've ever known about learning itself. And think about how we can create atmospheres for learning in our own homes, in our early learning centers, in our parks, in our schools, in our communities, in our region. If we create atmospheres for learning, we'll carry forward the, the, the legacy of Fred, whether we know or want to do so or not. And I, I want to add one thing about Fred's slowness, because I think it ties into one of the um, questions in the Q&A. Uh, Carrie asked, how do we engage in wonder and creativity and curiosity in times when we are overwhelmed and or frustrated? And this is a really fascinating part of the neighborhood. So if you've seen the documentary, you know, you've probably seen the scene where they, Fred sets an egg timer and he just lets it count down for a minute. He doesn't do anything else. He just lets the full minute go by 
There are scenes in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood of Fred literally sitting in his living room watching paint dry. It was a slow show. It was a quiet show. And, you know, what was interesting is there's actually all sorts of science behind that, too. I, I mentioned earlier the importance of getting bored, the importance of unstructured free time. Um, often, I think we find, especially for kids, that it's when we let ourselves get bored, when we let ourselves get absent-minded, that is where some of our best ideas spring from. There is an amazing statistic in, in our book that I think it's about 78% of people have their best ideas in one place. And that place is the shower. Because in the shower, you're not overwhelmed. You're not frustrated. You're just in the shower. It's the one place where we're not letting our phones get to us. It's the one place where we're not running off to do the next thing. When we give ourselves that sort of quiet time, when we give ourselves permission to walk away from whatever might be overwhelming or frustrating in the moment, that creativity, that curiosity, that sense of wonder will come back. We just have to make space for it. I totally agree. We might have lost Charlotte. Yeah, I think I think the winds might have interrupted <laughs> Charlotte's technology. I see some other questions here. There's there's a question here about any special tips for teens. Um, yes, we think so. Uh, and I'll tell you, it feels like there are lots of special tips for us as adults. And you can imagine that as parents, Ryan and I have been personally challenged by undertaking a project like this. I, I will share with you. I have. Um, a preteen, very soon to be a pre, very soon to be a teenager, if not a 40 year old <laughs> living in my household. And we all know the neuroscience and you know how uh, the teenage brain is developed, is, is essentially doing a whole uh, rewiring of the neurons that meet our, that allow us to be ourselves, right? And kids are redeveloping their identities. And in the process, they're seeking affirmation and safety and comfort. So that example of the ask it basket, I sometimes like to think, I hope that's an 11th grade classroom and not a kindergarten classroom. Ryan and I actually don't recall, and we've almost purposely not asked at this point, like what kind of classroom was this? Because that's the tactical type of thing that a teacher can do as much in an 11th grade classroom as in an early learning center. I'll also share a very personal example uh, with my older daughter. This was um, not too long ago. What you need to know about my household is that my wife is Asian American and so my kids are mixed race. And we try and protect our kids from the evils of the world, but not letting them be naive. And like any household, the news of the day spreads in. And shortly after some mass shootings of Asian Americans in Atlanta, I was lying on the floor and my daughter in a most unexpected way said, Daddy, am I gonna be shot? Sadly, it's a question that a lot of kids of a lot of different races in this country might ask at different points. You can imagine the fear I felt in that moment and also the rush of feelings that I had. And fortunately, I was able to learn, you know, think back on what I've learned from learning about Fred and his work and, and realize, you know, at that moment, I just need to make sure that this girl feels safe, that I acknowledge that she has big feelings that I acknowledge that she has big questions, to acknowledge that I don't have the answers, but that together we'll figure things out. It's that role of that caring adult, creating that atmosphere that allows as much for wonder and curiosity and creativity as it allows for safety and comfort and, and an acceptance of humanity. Um. Carrie asked, if I want my teaching team to experience this webinar, how can they get access? Carrie, I do believe that there will be a recording of this. Um, well, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought I, I froze there for a second. I do believe there'll be a recording, Carrie. I am actually going to put in the chat our email address. Please feel free to reach out anytime. We'll Zoom with any teaching team anytime. We'll have a book discussion. We can do this presentation. We can dive deeper. Um, we love talking with teachers. We love talking with parents. Please reach out to us anytime. We'd be happy to join you all virtually or in person. We'll be in California a lot this year. <laughs> and we do have videos that we can share as well. Oh, Paul's letting us know that the power is out at the Parent Venture office. And the power is out at the Parent Venture backup office, it seems like, too. 
Well, as some of you depart, uh, Ryan and I still have a minute or two. So we'll hang around here in case you have questions. Mm -hmm. We're so honored that the Parent Venture invite us to be part of this conversation with you tonight. Uh, we hope we've added just a little bit of um, good thinking to your world and challenged you like Fred challenged us all to make goodness attractive and um, help us to spread this Fred method by sharing this book with your local library, with your teachers. And if we can be helpful to you, as Ryan said, please reach out to us. Thank you all so much. And gracias to uh, Luis. We really appreciate the interpretation. And uh, we're so grateful that you are all here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Make it a good day in your neighborhood. <laughs>